Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this afternoon with our uh, young adult college and career group. I thank you so much, Father, for their commitment to you, commitment, Father God, to the worship and commitment, Lord, to this church. And I pray as we look into your word, Father, just awaken us. Awaken us, Father, to the beauty of who you are, and even more, awaken us, Father God, to the struggles of what you've called us to be. And Father, I pray that we will uh, wise up. I pray that we will stand strong. I pray, Father God, that our focus will be uh, intentional on you. And I ask God that this time will be a time dedicated to you. May our hearts be open to hear your word. But even more than just hearing your word, God, I pray that we will put it into action. That God, that we won't just sit on it or, or just think about it, but we would allow for your word to drive us into action so that we may see and test your good and wonderful and faithful love to us. So God, speak to us today. Allow for your word to uh, melt our hearts as we stand and sit before you. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going through a new series, The Seven Churches of Revelation. It's really a wonderful series. We're dealing with uh, the seven churches that are within this boundary of Turkey, uh, the area of Turkey, and they're going through a lot of struggle. And Jesus is He's calling the Apostle John, his beloved apostle, to write them these letters. Write them a letter of what's going on with their lives and even eventually write them a letter that tells them what's going to happen in the future and to ask them to endure, to endure as a church, to endure as a people, right? And one of the things that he begins to, uh, to, to express to them is this. I know that you have fears. Everybody has fears. You have fears, I have. We all have a... a, a journey of fears in our lives, whether it be you fear your family, whether it be because you fear the loss of uh, your, your self-value, your pride, whether you fear being shamed before people, whether you fear losing money, whether you fear your independence being lost, whether you fear anything. Everyone has fears. Your fear of not being loved, everyone has fears. And some of us, our fears are so debilitating that it causes us to come to a place where we will really actually disobey God in order to hold on to what we really want. Jesus comes and he says, I understand that you have fears, but I want you to understand something. More than fearing that, you should fear me. More than fearing those things, and the loss of those things, you should actually fear me. See, those things, yeah, they can probably mess, up, mess you up uh, physically, mess you up in this lifetime, but fear me, the one who can actually mess you up physically and spiritually, right? You should fear the loss of me, not the loss of that. And he shows himself to John in this extraordinary, powerful, extravagant way. And John fell dead at his feet almost. And the reason for that was this. Jesus wanted to show John and to, for John to express it to the churches. Fear me not because I want to lord over you and kind of tell you what to do. Fear me because... In me, all those other fears are put into perspective. That I am that powerful. That you do not have to worry about what's going to happen with your family. That you don't have to worry what will happen if you lose this. Actually, if you lose that, you will gain life. The Bible says what? Those who give their life will actually gain their life. But those who keep their life will actually lose it. See, Jesus is calling his people to surrender their self-worth, their self-value, to surrender their pride, surrender everything that they claim as important. Let it go. Receive me. And in receiving me, there is life. Right? Do you believe that I'm powerful enough to make it happen? Do you trust that I can actually make your life well? That I can put all those things in the right perspective? Jesus has feared me. We all have fears. And today as we engage in the next church, as he, as he writes the first letter to the church of Ephesus, he begins to call out specifically their fear. He begins to call out a very uh, strong issue that they were dealing with. And I think it's an issue that maybe our church sometimes deal with as well. And as we look into this church, as we look into its, um, its dynamic, we're going to see that. And we're going to maybe draw some truth out of this time. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, in, the, in the pews in your Bibles, it's on page 861. Okay, 861 is the bottom right on page 861 of your pews in your Bibles, last few pages. I love those Bibles. You just got them. Use them, okay? If you don't have a Bible, it's yours. Keep it. If you do have a Bible, don't steal them, okay? That's bad, all right? So open your Bibles, eight, page 861. 
Revelation chapter 2, to the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus. Take your time, don't worry. I like to hear Bibles flip. It's beautiful, beautiful. Revelation chapter 2, check it out. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give, to the, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Right? The city of Ephesus is home to one of the seven great wonders of the world, seven great ancient wonders of the world. You know the ancient wonders like the Pyramid of Giza, the Great Walls of China, the Colossus of Rhodes, right? It's home to the Temple of Artemis, one of the greatest temples in the world. And it happened that they built this temple because a meteorite fell upon this area, and the people claimed that that meteorite was sent by the god Artemis. Right? And because of that, they began to build this huge temple around it, a ginormous temple around it. And it brought a lot of people coming in to worship, to pray, to give respect. And it became a city of, full of commerce, lots of commerce. It became a city that's over 250 million people at most coming in there. And because of that, lots of people, lots of vendors who worked there, they made a living off of all these people who were traveling into this place, worshiping in the, at the Temple of Artemis. And the big problem was, here are Christians now, we're coming in to this area. Paul comes in, in Acts chapter 19, if you read it, he begins to come in and begins to preach the gospel. He stays with them for two years, sharing the, the, the scriptures, sharing the word of God, and it begins to transform the city. People were beginning to um, come to faith in the big cities, not in the small rural areas, but actually in the big cities. People were coming to know the Lord experience who he is and changing their life around and because of that lots of people stopped worshiping artemis and a lot of these vendors were upset angry and really started persecuting christians all over the place especially in ephesus right they persecuted them because of their of these people of them losing their money they persecuted because these christians ended up loving the poor and these poor people were coming to jesus christ rather than going to the temple of artemis and that was not good for them to these, uh, um, these vendors. And so persecution broke out among Christians. And so Jesus writes to them, and he commends them for this. He commends them for enduring hardship. He says, I, I, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance, right? You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Day in and day out, they face all of these perseverance, and yet they continue to grow as a church, Okay? And one of the things on top of that that they were so good at was this. Because there was so much persecution from the inside, they began to grow stronger within themselves. They began to grow stronger in God's word. They began to test everything that people were saying. In a big city, you begin to have lots of different teachers and a lot of different people coming in and sharing things to you. And because they were devoted to God and to his word, they made sure that everything that was said to them, they tested it through God's word. They made sure that it was true. They made sure that these people were actually speaking God's word rather than speaking their own opinions, right? And what they found out was a lot of these people came in and said, I'm an apostle for Jesus Christ. Let me share with you some words. They spoke these words. The people of God at Ephesus realized, you're not an apostle. You're, you're, you are a, um, um, what's the word? Uh, You are a not real person. Not, you are a, uh, a false prophet. You are a false prophet. Heretic, oh my goodness. Right? You are a, you are a false prophet. You're not, you're, not, you're not speaking God's word honestly here. And they fought against them. And they actually kicked those people out. Right? Do you know how crazy it is when someone comes and preach and then you said, you as a people of God stands up and said, you're a false prophet. Get out of my church. It's intense. Right? It's an intense moment. But these people, they were so devoted to the word of God that they were willing to do it. Let me tell you how, let me tell you how crazy, can you guys imagine this? Let me, let me give you an example. When I was in seminary, my first year in seminary, I wrote a paper on the book of Malachi, 
right? I, I, was, um, I was writing this paper in the book of Malachi. Malachi has four chapters, right, that you have to write through. And I was, I was watching one night, one morning, uh, on the channel TBN, you know, channel 40, uh, channel 40 or 44, Trinity Broadcasting Network, you know, those guys that look really sharp with their Armani suit, red tie, like bleach, bleach teeth that like shines through the camera. It's, it's fin- and like hair combed back and they're all tan, right? And like he's speaking, he's talking with that voice that's like sounds so melodic and so like godly at the same time. You're like listening, you just, you just melt into this person's like uh, voice, right? And I remember as he was preaching, he was talking about Malachi and Malachi is really talking about offering and giving, right? And he was, he was telling the people and I think it was one of those channels where um, they were preaching this, this gospel about, hey, if you give to the Lord, he will bless you more. Even if you have nothing, continue to give to me or to us, and God will bless you, right? That's that prosperity gospel idea. And so he was, he was preaching, and he was sharing it, and then he began to say, start saying stuff. And I was listening. I was, like, listening in the background. But he started saying, like, you know, Malachi chapter 5, the Lord said, blah, 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 blah. And, and, he, and he said something, and I was like, whoa, whoa. I stopped for a second. I was like, okay, well, he just said Ma- Malachi chapter 5. Maybe I, maybe I heard it wrong. Right? Maybe I heard it wrong. And then he repeated again, in Malachi chapter 5, verse something, something, you know, and he's, and he's talking about this. And I'm thinking, okay, something's wrong, because maybe he's just misquoting a, a chapter 4 or something, right? Chapter 3. So I opened my Bible, I was looking through it, I'm like, I don't see this verse he's quoting from. Where is this verse that he's quoting from, right? And I realized he wasn't quoting from the Bible. He threw out a verse from a chapter that wasn't even in the Bible, right? And you know what's the worst part? It wasn't the part that he was being uh, a total, like, uh, heretic. The worst part was this. It's when the camera zoomed to the people. When the camera zoomed over to everyone. You know when you, when you watch that, what were the people doing? They were standing up. Oh, they got excited. Like, yeah, preacher, preacher. And their hands are up. They're dancing around. Like, yeah. You know, and, and they're hearing this. And all I'm saying when I was sitting there, I was like, oh, someone just open your Bible. Someone just, someone just open the Bible. I mean, just, just check out the verse you just quoted, please. And you're going to realize you can't find it. Somebody just open your Bible. And you'll know that there is no Malachi chapter 5. But throughout the whole, and it stayed with the people because they were excited. You know, we, the, the, the channel wants people to see how excited these people were to give their money so that other people will call in to give their money. And I'm like, just open your Bible. And the Bible is like sitting on the pews, you know. People actually hold their Bible like, yeah, you know, praise the Lord. And like, just open it. Open it. Listen. Read it. You see, sometimes churches, we... We come to a place where we, we're so Bible illiterate that when someone comes and shares the word of God to you, you, you might not know that it's God's word or not. You take it as it is. You should test every time someone preaches. Even when I preach, you should test it, right? I'm thinking like one day I'll just preach a really blasphemous message, see what happens, right? I want someone to see what happens, right? Just for the sake of it, see what happens, you know? See if you guys will catch it. I'm serious, right? Because it's so important to honor and preserve the truth of God's word. It is so deep and and, and real to preserve this truth, to hold and to live by it. Let me tell you how crazy this was. There was a a time when I was um, was a teacher in in college where, uh, I think I shared the story, where we we had a retreat. I was a teacher at this retreat, and um, they invited the speaker who, the pastor didn't really, like, check him off. He just invited the preacher over. And this preacher got up and he said something very blasphemous. He said, you know, unless you speak in tongues, you are not saved, right? Unless you actually have the gift of tongues, you are not saved. And so, you know, like all the teachers were outside because we we're just being bums. We didn't want to listen. We we're just sitting out there just laughing and playing, right? And all of a sudden we saw like this commotion going on in the room because one kid just got up and just raised his hands. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right? Can you imagine stopping the sermon? Like right now, all of a sudden one of you just raise your hands. Like, oh, Pastor, whoa, 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 right? And just interrupting the whole message just to call me out, right? This guy, this little kid, he, he raised his head and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. My pastor doesn't speak in tongues. Is he not saved? So the speaker was like, hmm, no. The kid, <laughs> right? And the kid, the kid was like, no, I think my pastor is saved. Something's wrong, right? And he was like looking around, trying to find all the teachers. And we were just out there like, what's going on in there, right? So we, and then we finally walked in. The teacher, and the pastor came in and he, and he heard this again, right? And so... You know, during retreat, you know, retreat, you have this, you know, emotion, you have this spot where it's like emotional, like it's middle of the night. Everyone's like really into worshiping God, listening to his word. Pastor comes in and said, okay, you have to go home, right? <laughs> to the speaker, you have to go home. We don't preach that here. I'm sorry, you know? And it was, it was awkward. And all the teachers were like, what, what should we do? 
Let's just, let's just go up and read praise, right? So we went up and we, just, we had praise for the rest of the night. It was weird, right? It was, it was this really awkward moment. But the thing is this. The thing is, would you be able to catch false teaching when it comes to you? See, the church of Ephesus, one of the biggest things about them that God commended them for was this. Not only did they persevere among all the persecution, they knew God's word so deep that when it was spoken wrongly or spoken falsely, they called it out. They fought them, right? They fought them tooth and nail. Truth of God's word before everything else. Now here, that, but that's not where my main part of this message is going. That's where the commendation, this is where God is giving them props, right? But where I'm going at is where God actually begins to um, give them a criticism, give them a, a, harsh, a harsh criticism. This is what he says to them in verse 4. He said this, I know all those things, I know your deeds, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know one of the biggest problems in the church when you get to become very intellectual? When a church begins to be actually really smart? When the church actually begins to know their Bible and know their truth and know how to articulate their faith and know how to stand up for their faith, you know one of the major issues that comes up afterwards? They forget to love. Knowledge puffs up, the Bible says. Love builds up. When a church gets really smart, which is not a bad thing, but sometimes they take their smart, they become prideful over it, and they forget to love. See, the church of Ephesus, they fought tooth and nail. People who were persecuting them, they strengthened themselves up. They continued to walk in faith. When false prophets came in, they rebuked, they walked away. But as they began to be so strong and began to fight so many people, they began to be suspicious of everybody else, of what everybody else is saying. They began to start um, condemning. They start criticizing. They start feeling bitter towards other people's actions that doesn't end up holding weight to the truth of God's word. They begin to look down upon them. See, when truth begins to embrace a person tremendously like this, and you don't temper it with love, with spirit, what happens? You become prideful, and love goes out the window. See, Jesus called out this church because why? They've forgotten to love. They've forgotten what it means to love people. They've forgotten what it means to love God. They served God, but they did not love God. They did what God asked them to do, but they did not love God. God, they've forgotten what love to God looks like. And because of that, they've forgotten what love to people ought to be. See, this is what I'm going to be focusing on today is this, love. Right? The call from this church was to remember your first love. What does that look like? How can we as a church begin to see this? How how can we as a church begin to live a life of truth and love here? I got three points for you guys, okay? For us to grow and learn from the church of Ephesus. The first point is this. Truth and love. Truth and love. You got to speak truth and love. Let me tell you something. When you begin to know God's word, when you begin to actually understand what he says about the human heart, the human spirit, when when you begin to understand what he says about the condition of humanity, and you know the truth of it, and you know the call that he's given you to live by, and you see a brother or a sister who is living against that or in rebellion of that or in disobedience of that, you have two options. One, right, you show them no love. This is how you show them no love. You go up to them and you rebuke them in anger. You go up to them and you tell them you're an idiot. You go up and you tell them and and you basically, instead of loving them, you condemn them for what they've done, right? You speak the truth, but you're condemning them with the truth. Okay? That's how you show no love. The second way you show no love is this. You don't even bother with them. You know the truth. You know they're walking away. You know they're in disobedience, and you keep quiet about it. Because in your heart, you're thinking, I don't care. Whatever. You see, one of the big issues for the church of Ephesus was this. They've forgotten how to love people. When they begin to rebuke their brothers and sisters, they didn't just rebuke in love. They condemned them by the truth. They condemned people by God's word. Or or when they see their brothers and sisters walking in disobedience, 
They say, forget it. I'm not going to deal with it. Do you understand? It is our prerogative as Christians that when we see our brothers and our sisters living in complete disobedience to God's word, it is on our shoulders, you guys, to go and to speak truth and love to them. You're not condemning them. I'm not telling you to go there and condemn them. Speaking truth and love is one of the hardest things to do as a believer. That's why you got to really think about what you're going to say before you actually go and say. You don't go with anger. You have to really sit down, pray about it for quite a while, and then go when your heart is right, when you're really about to go and say, look, I got something to say to you. You're not going to like it, but I love you. I see this hurting you, and I want to I I express God's truth to you about it. You speak God's truth and love. Okay? But the worst thing, I feel like the worst thing sometimes our church does is that we don't say anything at all. We allow for them to continue in their disobedience. Either we're afraid to call them out, we're afraid to, to, to speak to them, we're afraid to, to sit down and, and, and have a conversation with them, or right, the reality is we just don't care. See, if God was to look at our church... TLC, maybe the one thing he will say is this, you're forsaking your first love. You think that by you keeping quiet about your brothers and sisters struggle, you think by not speaking to them and and sharing God's word to them that you're somehow loving them? You're not. You're not. You've actually forgotten what love is. Love is meant to take this truth and free them from it, free them with it. You're meant to sit down and share it with them. You're not supposed to be afraid of them, right? You can't be afraid of them. It's not your opinion that you're giving to them. You guys didn't realize that? You're not giving your opinion to them. You're giving God's word to them. Hey, sis, I've been noticing this thing about you lately. Is everything okay? I'm concerned. This is what God's word is mentioning about this. I want to just bring it up, see if there's any issue about that that we can talk about. Instead of saying, you know what, they'll get over it. It'll be okay. Let's just see what happens. That's not love, you guys. That's the opposite of love. The greatest sin of of, um, some people, they're afraid to act because they're afraid to create error. The greatest sin of action and creating error is the sin of not doing anything. It's not doing anything. Right? Who said this? I think it was Einstein or Luther. Oh, someone said, someone said, someone said the, the, the greatest evil in this world is not bad people doing bad stuff. The greatest evil in the world is good people sitting around watching bad people do bad stuff. Right? It's that you sit around and you watch your brother and sister dig themselves into these holes that they can't get out of. And instead of actually going to them and speaking truth and love with them, you just watch them do that. That's not love. And you really got to check your heart. You really got to check your heart. How many of you guys have done that? Like, maybe you hang out with a bunch of friends, and, you know, just like one person just seems like really odd, right? Like something's really wrong. But you're just like, oh, forget it, whatever, right? Let's not deal with that. Instead, you should sit there and be like, hey, let me think about this. Right? Something's wrong. Let me, let me take some time, figure things out, and let me approach them with love and share these things with them. See, Jesus was calling out the church of Ephesus. He said, you guys are great. You're dutiful. You're faithful. You're serving. You're, you're, you're enduring. You're even fighting off false prophets. But the one thing you have forgotten is you've forgotten love. You've taken my truth. You've boasted your head with it. It's become this huge head knowledge. And you've used it. Instead of loving your people, you've used it to condemn them. Or you've actually just turned away from them. That's not love, right? How can, we learn from the tru- how can we learn from the church of Ephesus? First, truth and love. Second, the compassion versus contempt. Compassion versus contempt. See, wh- one of the things, when, what happens when you begin to get a little bit prideful about God's word, when you feel like, you know, you're pretty assured of your salvation, right? One of the things that ends up happening is that you're so sure of your salvation that you begin to judge everyone else of their salvation. It's like, mm, that's, they're not saved, Right? I know they're not saved. Not, I see no fruit from their lives. They're a bunch of hypocrites, right? One thing, when you begin to be so sure about your salvation, you begin to judge other people of their salvation. You begin to judge them for what they do and what they do not do. You begin to judge them for their action or inaction. 
You begin to judge them on how they act before you and what they say before you. You show them contempt. You may not say it out loud, but you think it in your head. You become, you become, you act contemptible to them. Rather than what? Compassion. You see, if your salvation is real, if you've really encountered Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the Scripture, the one who created all things, one of the one things you would guarantee have is compassion. Because you realize something. How dare I look upon my brother with contempt when I know myself that I am a sinner? Isn't it funny that we can call out every sin in everyone else, but when it comes to our sins, we can make a thousand excuses for it? Doesn't that make sense? It's like we, we can call out every single wrong sin in everyone's life, but when it comes to our life, we make a hundred excuses for why it's acceptable for us to continue to do what we're doing. You see, instead of showing compassion, we show contempt. Instead of showing care and love and understanding and grace, right, we point fingers, we mock, we judge, we feel superior. See, the gospel, as Jesus speaks to us, as he calls out the church in Ephesus, was this. You look at your brothers and your sisters, and you look down upon them. Yeah, I know you're smart. I know you're, you're smart enough to know God's word so that you can, you, you can, um, kick out any false prophet that comes to your church, but your smartness, your intellect, your intellectual arrogance have cost you your love. Because you think that you are so great of how smart you are and how holy you are, but you forget how messed up you actually are yourself. You see all the wrongs in people and you forget the wrong in you. Compassion. That's what he's asking for. He called out the church. He said, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. You know, when the, first, when the church first started with Aquila and Priscilla in Acts, it was a deep group of loving people getting together, loving God, loving each other, breaking down caste systems, rich mingling with the poor, right? Um, saving lost hearts, saving children, uh, um, protecting the widows, caring for the orphans. It was, it, was a, it was a community of love and care that showed no favoritism, that showed no contempt for one another. And yet, as they battled the forces around them, as they battled the situation around them, as they begin to battle false prophets and false teachers, they start feeling contemptible. They start feeling like they are pride. They start feeling like they are smart enough to look down on others. They start saying stuff like, I don't even know if he's a Christian anymore. I don't even know if that person is saved. Or they, even, they go even further. You know what? That person can't be saved. There is no fruit in their lives. They're hypocrites. You show content, but not compassion. What you should be saying is this. How can I look and see the, see the speck in my brother's eyes when I can't even see the big old plank in my eyes? Right? Jesus was right when he said that. We know how to judge everyone else, but we don't even know how to judge ourselves. How can we be, how can we learn from the church of Ephesus? Truth and love. We got to speak truth and love. Compassion over contempt. See, I know some of our hearts were like that, right? Some of us were, were prideful enough that we would actually show judgmental arrogance towards our sisters and our brothers. Maybe we don't say it out loud. Maybe we don't, like, act it out in front of them. But in our hearts and our minds, we're we're doing it. Right? We're doing it. Here's the last thing. Okay? Here's the last thing. How can we learn from the church of Ephesus in terms of love? It's Jesus as the person, not the concept. See, because honestly, when it it boils down to this, how, how am I supposed to honestly show love to anyone? Tony, how am I supposed to have the, the strength to love anybody, to, to, to endure with such patience with them over and over? How, am I not, how can I possibly not be contemptible to what that person is doing? Look at them. How can I not do that? 
by seeing Jesus and remembering that Jesus is a person, not a concept. See, a lot of times we see Jesus as a concept. Jesus is love. Jesus died for me. It's, it's, he, he showed me grace. No, see him as a person. See him as the unique God, the, the God who uniquely became man. See him as the one who chose to disregard his eternal connection to the Father and to the Spirit, to step down on this earth to endure loneliness, pain, rejection, hatred, so that what you and I can come to him. See him as a person who would endure suffering so that you and I can see life. See him as that person. See, most people, when they come to Christianity, they come to Christianity with concepts. I'm going to accept this concept. No, when you come to Christianity, what you're going to realize is you come in, in contact with a person. See, if you've never come in contact with the person of Jesus Christ, you really got to question your faith. If your faith is all about the understanding you have in your head and the works that you do with your body and not ever coming to real connection with the person of Jesus Christ, you fall into this category of the church. You have forsaken your first love. You see Jesus not as the person he is, but you see Jesus as a concept to be understood and to be followed. Jesus is a person. He's a person. That's why he showed himself to John that way. Remember me. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done. See, that's how you begin to speak truth and love to people. That's how you begin to live in compassion with others. You you get connected to someone, to a real person who's shown you everlasting love. And then you pour that love back into people. You know what the heart of salt is when we do salt in our church? Yes, it is to teach truth and it is to be discipled. But the real depth of, of, of salt is this. It's to show people love. Is to be able to show love to your brothers and your sisters, enduring love. Love that's full of compassion, not contempt. Love that is that is that is so deep that you will speak the truth to them, even if it hurts. Love that will not look down or abandon, but will chase after. Love because you have you yourself have been connected to the deeper love, which is Jesus Christ. Right? That's love. That's how, you, that's how you continue things, even when you cannot feel it. Right? A lot of people, they always say, Pastor, I can't do this anymore. I don't feel it. You know what the real issue is? Right? The real issue is maybe the love between you and Jesus, is, there's something wrong there. Right? Because a lot of times, you don't have to feel it to continue to love. Out of love, you do it anyways. Right? I'll give you an example. My kid cries all the time. He's a baby. I guess, I guess that's an excuse, right? But, you know, he cries all the time. It's like middle of the night. And, like, me and Trisha, I'm like, I'm like, I'm inside the bed, and she's outside. And sometimes we kind of fight to see who sleeps. Whoever sleeps on the outside is the one who gets up, right? So sometimes she kind of crawls over, and she kind of rolls over me so that I will be on the outside, right? So that, so that way I can, like, get the kid, you know? And in my head, every, every time he wakes me up, because I, I don't take naps very well. People take naps well. I don't take naps well. If I nap... It's eight hours straight, okay? It's no, it's no, like, it's no such thing as, like, one and a half hour and then wake up and do my thing, okay? If it's one and a half hour and he goes off, right? Like, all of a sudden, like, in my head, I'm like, mm, right? This is my, like, mm, right? And Trisha's like, don't, mm, just go get him. Like, mm, right? It's like, like, this, this, I don't want to, right? I'm like, you go get him. Like, in my head, like, you go get him, right? But we do it. We do it, why? Because there's love, right? We don't have to feel it. We don't have to feel like, oh, I, 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 I love you so much that I have to wake up and go. To, you know, honestly, right? you're going to be like, I'm upset. You're waking me up. Why can't you just sleep through the night, bro, right? Just, just be a man and sleep through the night, you know? But it's like he wakes you up and you're like, mm, but you go because there is love. You endure that for love. In the same way, in the same way, you endure life with each other. You endure life with each other. You endure life before God. I don't feel it today. But out of love, I will do it. I don't, I don't have that, 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 that 
that, that, that feeling of wanting to. I'm, the, the stars aren't aligned correctly today, Tony. Right? Don't, don't, don't you feel that? Like sometimes you, things have to run perfectly before you can actually sit down and pray. Right? It's like, oh, I can't pray right now. Why? Things just don't feel right. Right? It's like, so when, when are they going to feel right? You know? It's like, I, I don't know. When they feel right, I'll sit down and pray. It doesn't seem, you should sit down and pray. Right? Sit down and pray because of love. I don't feel it, God, but I want to know you. And we continue that, right? You obey not because of how you feel. You obey because of love, right? When you speak truth into people, you don't do it because you feel like it. You don't do it because you want to condemn them. You do it because God said, carry the burden of your brothers and sisters. Do it out of love. When you begin to live together and be together long enough and all these, these, these flaws of, each one of, uh, of one another begin to show up and we see it and we get annoyed by it and we're upset by it and we begin to feel like content towards each other for it. Right? The Bible says what? How can you look at your brother with evil when you yourself was a product of evil? When you yourself was the product of grace, that you were saved by grace itself. So how can you look at your brother with contempt? But rather look at them with compassion. You see, it's not about how you feel. It's about trusting and loving the one who has loved you first and loving him through that and loving people through him. Right? The church of Ephesus, you guys, they were a good church. Really powerful church. From that church, great things happened. They were a great church because in the midst of In the midst of persecution, they stood strong. In the midst of all these people coming in and trying to deceive them, they were smart and wise enough to block all those people out. But the one thing that they have forgotten, the one thing that God holds against them is this. You have forgotten how to love. TLC, I pray above all things that we will never forget how to love. That we will call each other out in truth. Because we love. That we will learn to show compassion to each other in spite of the other person. You don't show compassion to someone because they deserve compassion. You show compassion to them in spite of what they deserve. That's real compassion. That's real love. Right? I pray, oh God, as a church, TLC, that you guys will be a church that sees Jesus not as a concept, not as a person to do VBS for, or not as a person to serve for, but as a person that you've known, a person that you've experienced, a person that you've realized would die to keep you. Whereas everything in your life demands that you die in order to keep it. He and he alone is the only person who said, I will die to keep you. Think about it. Everything in your life has demanded that you die to keep it. Whether it's your family, your friends, your material blessings, your money, everything that you are living and fighting for, it demands that you die and put all your energy, all your heart in order to keep it. And yet Jesus says, I don't want anything from you. I will die to keep you because you're precious to me. That's the person we encounter. That's the person whom we love. And that's the person whom we begin to fall back in love with. You have forgotten your first love, you guys. You have forsaken your first love. And you know why Jesus said this? It sounds kind of mean, but he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The lampstand was a symbolic thing for the light of the world, a lamp, right? But it's symbolic for the church. If a church no longer loves, you know what God will do to that church? He will close it. What is the point of having a body of people who is meant to portray my light of love to the world, stop doing that. I will snuff that light out. Right? What did the Bible say? What did Jesus say? This is how the world will know that you are my disciple. This is how you can shine your light to this world is by how you loving each other. If you are not showing love to one another, then why are you a church? Right? And ultimately, this is it, verse 7. This is my final conclusion. He says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You know what Jesus is saying? He's not saying this. Listen to me, and I'll give you a prize, right? You get heaven, right? 
Listen to me, obey me, and I'll give you this as a consolation prize. No, he's saying this. Listen to me because this is the investment of what you're, 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 you're investing eternity into. This is what you're giving eternity. This is what eternity is about. What do you think the measure of your life will be when you stand before God? When you stand before God, what do you think the ultimate measure of your life will be? Two things. Lord, I love you with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. And God, I love my neighbors as myself. That is the measure of your life before God. And when he calls the church of Ephesus, return back to the heights in which you have fallen. Remember to love. You invest in love. All of eternity, which you're investing in, you're investing in love. You guys realize that? In your singleness and in your time alone, you're investing. The things that you're doing, if you're doing it, should be investing into love. Right? And I say this to all college singles, that you, if you have three months off in the summer, use it to invest in love. Right? For all you married people, use your marriage as a way to invest in love. Because the greatest measure at the end of your life will not be about what you have attained, what you have done. The greatest measure is what you have loved with, how much you have loved, and what you are willing to do because of love. How far of a depth would you go for love? Do you understand why there are people out in the mission field in the middle of nowhere, suffering from the middle of nothing, why they're out there? It's not because they feel like, ooh, I'm just loving to live with spiders and monkeys and all these great, I just love that mug, right? It's not because of that. It's because there's a love that is deep in them and they're investing in that. There's a love that drives them. There's a love for the Father and it's people that moves them. And as a church, we need to be the exact same way. Our investment in, our, in the people around us, our investment in things we do, is not an investment in growing our church. It's not an investment in growing our, our plans and our, our Our things, the things that we are doing at TLC is an investment in growing in our depth of love for God and our depth of love for one another. We throw you guys into salt. Why? Because we know that you guys are not going to get along with each other. You guys are going to fight and clash, and you're going to be afraid to talk to each other about love and, and deal with each other in love. That's why you were together, right? That's why we're dealing with you guys, so that you can love. You have to fight to love. It's hard to love someone, so you have to fight to love that person. Love is a choice not a feeling that's why we do what we do that's why we invest in the things that we invest for missions for uh, community groups for the things that we do. it's to build love i hold this against you jesus says to ephesus you have forsaken your first love remember the height from which you have fallen repent and do the things that you did at first For if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Repent. TLC, this is my prayer. Okay? I want you guys to be smart. Okay? I want you you guys to be an intellectual crowd, be able to have your conversations correctly. But I want you to be a church that loves each other. I want you to be a church that be able to call out your sister and your brother if you find them walking in disobedience to God. Call them out in love. I want you to be a church that can show compassion in spite of those people, in spite of how people respond to you and do to you, to show compassion to them. That's how the world knows that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not on how big your church is or how great the the brand name of our church may be. It's whether you've shown love to those who don't deserve it, whether you've shown love to each other, compassion to each other, and willing to speak truth into each other's life. You guys follow me? All right. Return back from the height from which you have fallen. All right. Let's return back to the heart of love before God. Let's pray. Can we just come before Father right now as, um, as we respond to him? The Bible says this, repent. It really means to repent, you guys. Repent does not mean to, like, feel bad and kind of forget about it. Repent means to know the wrong of our hearts and do the opposite now. To change our way of thinking, to change our direction of which we are living. I know life is hard. I know that things hurt. I know that pain 
endures, but we have one who has endured much pain as well, who can sympathize with us, who gives us hope. He calls us to repent and to once again love, to love that brother and that sister that's so deep and difficult to love, to love our families, which are so hard and difficult to love at times, to show compassion, to speak truth. Can we come before the Father? You guys, can we begin to acknowledge that, Lord, I see the contempt in my heart. I see the plank in my eyes, O oh Lord. I see the judgment in my soul. Father, may this day be the day where that stops. May this day be the day where that stops and I move forward with love. And though it will be a difficult journey, I will fight for love. Though it is hard at times, I will always speak the truth in love. I will not ignore nor abandon my brothers and sisters nor my families, but I will speak truth into their lives in love. I will see the failures of myself and not be contemptible to others. I will show compassion and grace. Can we come before the Father? Can we pray that as a prayer of repentance? If you have something that's very specific in you, I want you to pray that. Something that's very specific in your life that maybe you're dealing with right now. Maybe it's a person in your life. Maybe it's someone that, that, that's been really difficult. You've actually vocally been contemptible too. Depend on that before God. So I know that you're smart. I know your deeds. I see your deeds. But this I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forgotten how to love. Let's pray. prayer is this, but that TLC will be a church that loves, that we will be a church, oh God, that has compassion, a church, God, that loves each other, a church, God, that loves you above all else. I pray, Lord, that we will be a church that speaks truth and love. I pray that we will be a church, Father God, that sees our own sins and therefore able to love others, knowing that we are a product and miracle itself of grace. I pray that we will be a church, oh God, that has that personal encounter with you. That we don't just serve the concept of you or the ideology of you. That we come face to face with you, Jesus Christ. The one who stepped down from heaven. Who did not see his title and his worth something to be acknowledged, but surrendered that and took on flesh. And suffered to the point of the cross so that you and I can come. So, Father, my Lord, take us, transform us, rebuke us, conform us to your word. May this day, O oh God, be the line in which we draw. May this day be the day, Father, would you draw this line that we will not live a life of hate. Not live a life, Father God, of contempt, but we will live a life, Lord God, reflecting love. For the wrongs in our hearts, Father God, may you restore us. For the pain in our souls, O oh Lord, may we draw from the cross. Teach us to love, Lord. May we be a church that honors your name. 
and shines your light. We love you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.